Hey guys, welcome back to This Month of Tea Science for November 2021. So I am still figuring this thing out. This is our second episode, right? So I'm keeping it going for two months in a row, but I am switching it up a little bit where last month I did four articles that I reviewed, four articles from October relating to tea science. This month I'm gonna do one. And I think going forward, I'm probably just gonna do one at a time because I realized that four such different articles together um, is kind of a lot. <laughs> It's a, it's a bit much and like most people just maybe are interested in one general topic or another. Um, so, you know, for instance, last time there was stuff related to health and plant biology and this, and it's like, you, you might have to sit through something you don't necessarily have a lot of interest in to get to one that you are interested in. So I'm just going to do one paper at a time, but I'm going to keep the theme of one per month, at least going forward. So that is the little pretext here, but uh, the article that I did pick is very interesting. So this one is called Discovery of Camellia sinensis Catechins as SARS-CoV-2 3CL Protease Inhibitors Through Molecular Docking Intra and Extracellular Assays. Okay, so um, I have tuned out a long time ago to the new coronavirus research. I, I, I keep an ear relatively open to it, but I think a lot of us are getting tired of hearing about it all the time. I certainly am. I don't doubt that it's important, but I wanted to bring this back. Like we have a new variant coming out. The thing's not going away. I like this paper because they do a really good job of measuring the relationship between the compounds in T and the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, so I remember right when the virus came out, you know, a year or two ago, people were talking about the research of tea consumption in relation to that virus. Like, can it reduce symptoms? Can it reduce your likelihood of a serious event if you are to get infected? So on and so forth. It caused a lot of controversy and people were very, you know, upset about it, saying that you should never, you know, never claim that this can be a cure when it's not. And... The, the science was never really putting out there that it's a cure, right? That the word cure was never ever written by a scientist. I can guarantee you that, but that was how it was uh, misconstrued. So we're going to go through this new paper where they're analyzing the relationship of T, T and SARS-CoV-2. And in fact, a certain uh, protein on the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's very important for the, for the virulence of the virus. And we're going to see like, what is it actually like to research this topic? And we're, and we're going to break it down so that you can have more of a nuanced view of how T interacts with this virus. So, um, that's why I picked it. I think people who are interested in this topic, who are tea drinkers, who are, want to know how T plays into their whole risk of getting the virus and, and things like that. This is kind of the level at which you need to be thinking about the role of tea as it pertains to interacting with the virus. Okay, so let's break down that title just for a second. Um, so Camellia sensus catechins, right? These are the really abundant polyphenols that are in tea. So we have the eight main ones, EGCG, GGC, CG, uh, CG, so on and so forth. I'll, I'll put them up here, give you an image to remind you of what those look like. So we're taking these catechins and we're analyzing through three assays how these catechins interact with a specific protein that's on the virus. It's a protease protein. And basically the pro a protease is a protein that chops up other proteins. So when the, when the virus is causing an infection and it's entering the cell and trying to replicate itself and grow and infect the host, it relies on these proteases. So it's a very important protein for the virus. Now, they're looking at just that protein on the virus. It's called the 3CL protease, 3CL protease, okay? Now they're seeing if they can, if these catechins, if these T compounds can inhibit that 3CL protease. Right, so that's that would be that would be nice if it could if it could do that, right? If the virus is trying to use this protease into the cell, and then the catechins could inhibit that protease from doing its work. The three assays they're using is molecular docking, 
Don't worry, we're going to get to all these in a second. Intra and extracellular assays. So molecular docking. They're just using a computer program, essentially. They've been able in the last 10, 20 years and more and more every day that passes to make these really sophisticated computer programs that take into consideration all of the laws of physics that govern how molecules interact with each other, how, how they're able to combine together and then disassociate with each other. They used some of this really advanced software to analyze how the catechins might interact with this specific 3CL protease. Then they examined through a really unique assay if it can, if it can inhibit the function of this protease within the cell. And basically they attached a, a bioluminescence piece. So that's a protein that emits light when it's cut, right? So they attached one of these proteins to another protein and they, they, they basically made this protein complex where if it's cut by the protease, then it emits light. So with this assay, you can see in a cell, you can measure in a cell, how active the protease protein is. So if there's a lot of light being emitted, then there's a lot of protein getting cut by the protease, right? If the 3CL protease is inhibited, then you would see much less light emitted from the cell. So that was a little assay they used. Extracellular is more simple. You don't need to be in the cell. You're basically just the protein and the catechins mixing together and you can, and you can see how much it inhibits the functions of that protease outside of the cell. Now, so, so, okay, so they use these three different assays, the, the computer one, the in the cell, the out of the cell, right? Those are the three ones they picked and they just wanna see which they, and then they chose 16, or was it 12, excuse me, 16. They chose 16 T catechins. So they chose a couple of the big ones and they chose a couple other ones that they've isolated from white tea and from different teas that were laying around the lab. A couple interesting looking T catechins they picked 16 of them and, and they ran all of them through this battery of tests, these three assays that they had selected. Let's get to the interesting findings. So, all right, molecular docking. So let's see from the results. Molecular docking results show that all catechins can bind to, C, to C3L protease, suggesting that these catechins have the potential to inhibit the 3CL protease. Okay, so on the computer program, uh, it did show that all these selected catechins are able to bind to the protein at various points on the protein. Okay, so that's a good sign. It doesn't say much, right? We don't know how strongly it's binding and how that binding is affecting the function of the protein yet, right? But we're taking this one step at a time. We know that they all have the potential for inhibitory effects against this protease. Cool. Um, intracellular, so except for, Two or three of the compounds, except for two, two or three of the catechins, all the catechins showed dose-dependent inhibition of the protease. Dose-dependent means the more catechins you had, the more it inhibited the protease. That's pretty interesting. So that that's like uh, 12 or 13 of the 16 selected catechins did, in fact, inhibit to some degree the protease inside the cell. So let me, and then let me, before I get to the implications of that finding, I'm gonna tie in the extracellular part. So basically the extracellular assay somewhat mirrored the intracellular assay where the ones that didn't inhibit the protease in the cell also didn't really do it outside of the cell. And the ones that inhibited it, it a lot in the cell also inhibited it a lot outside of the cell. But you know, so they, they resembled one another in the cell being the more important one, but both are good pieces of information to have. Now, just simply inhibiting the function of the protein is not necessarily enough. You need to inhibit it a lot and you need to inhibit it with a concentration of the T catechin that is feasible, that's relevant. So we have this certain value. We have this IC50 value and that is how much of your catechin of your target treatment compound do you need in order to inhibit 50% of the protein that you're looking at, right? So if I'm trying to inhibit this protease to 50% of its original value, of its original potency, what is the concentration of the catechin that I need in order to inhibit it at 50%? That's a crucial figure. And it doesn't matter if you're doing catechins and protease 
or a different polyphenol and amylase. This IC50 value is the same, same concept across the board. Now, you want a low IC50 value. So you want, you want your, your target treatment compound to be able to inhibit the protein to 50% at a very low concentration. So that means you don't have to take a lot of it. And, and, this, is, and this is kind of the key crucial point for this entire study. Um, the, the catechins in tea don't accumulate in your blood serum, in your bloodstream at super high concentrations. They get broken down in the gut and they don't cross the intestinal barrier intact very often. For example, with EGCG, we're looking at low micromolar concentrations of EGCG in the bloodstream. In this study, for example, the, the IC50 value of EGCG was really high. I'm trying to find it here for you. It was high, way too high. It, it, was, it was way too high, so I, I, I should have I uh, highlighted the value, but I didn't, it, you know, the value is not important because I looked at it and I was like, that's just a ridiculous, that's, you know, that's not really relevant because the EGCG value is over 100 micromolar. That was the concentration you needed to inhibit the, the protease to 50%. But we only have one or two micromolar of EGCG in our blood at any given time, you know? If you just chug a big glass of green tea, 30 minutes later, you might have one to two micromolar in your, um, in your system, and that's not even close to enough to, in to inhibit this, this protease. So that's the, that's the number we're looking at. Interestingly, G uh, GCG, which is a very, very similar form of EGCG, did inhibit the, the protease way more effectively. Okay, so we had a couple, we had like two or three of these catechins that did get in that low EC50 value range where they're inhibiting the protease to 50% at low-ish micromolar concentrations, although still not quite at concentrations that you would possibly ever see in a human. Interestingly, they found like example, for example, with GCG and EGCG. So these molecules are super similar. You know, so they just look a little bit different. It's the same amount of each of its atoms. You know, it's just structured a little bit differently, but apparently that change was enough to make a big difference. It affects how it enters the protein and how it attaches the protein. So th that's useful information, right? And here's one more tidbit from this, is that it's, this isn't the only way to inhibit or to play a role in a SARS-CoV-2 infection, right? Because um, a lot of the people who passed away from this virus did so as a result of that big, quote unquote, cytokine storm that happened after the infection occurred. It's this huge inflammatory response, a lot of free radical formation and oxidative damage after the infection. Now, EGCG is way more antioxidative and anti-inflammatory than GCG is. So in that sense, EGCG might be more effective in reducing the harmful effect of this virus than G GCG through a different mechanism. So it's not all about how well can you inhibit this one protein on the virus. It's more of a, you have to, you know, it's a holistic system here. You know, you have to think about our inflammatory response um, and all of these other factors. You could inhibit a different part of the virus not just that one 3CL protease. But in terms of inhibiting this particular protein, GCG is more effective than EGCG, which I didn't expect. You know, everyone always pats EGCG on the back and it's kind of like, they say it can do everything. It's this mir miracle molecule in terms of T phytonutrients and it is, but you know, I guess not, not across the board. Sometimes it's not the best and sometimes it is. And so that's why I got to do this research so you actually see. You know, a lot of people would probably, before this came out, they'd probably think the EGCG is the most effective inhibitor. Um, it's the biggest. It has a ton of these hydroxyl groups hanging off of it, but, you know, that's not the case. So it's good that we did the research. So now we know. Um, let's see. That's about it, guys. I'm going to wrap this up like this. I'm going to wrap this up like this. From this research, some T catechins were found to inhibit this 3CL protease pretty well. 
pretty, pretty, pretty well. Okay, not good enough where we can immediately start using this for clinical trials because like I said, that millimolar, excuse me, micromolar concentration needed to inhibit the the protein was still too high and we can't really attain, we can't really get to those concentrations by just drinking tea. Okay. So will we be able to consume these catechins orally through tea to inhibit the virus at physiologically relevant levels? Probably not, probably not, but that's not really exactly what it's about. We're exploring how, what conformational changes and what differences between these molecules affect its efficacy in inhibiting this. And then the authors in the end, they say this is useful for further development of molecules that could inhibit it better. So, and this, this is how a lot of drugs are developed actually. They'll, they'll test like a ton of molecules at the same time to see which ones have some type of effect. They'll find the ones that are relatively effective and then they'll further modify those, those molecules themselves to optimize its effects. So this is kind of like a step in the right direction. If we can use these natural plant molecules to get us going in the right direction of what might be most effective in inhibiting the, the virulence of this, of this uh, virus. Because damn it, I'm tired of this thing and I would like it to go away. And maybe, you know, whatever might be able to help is worth checking out. This is the steps that it takes to research this type of thing, which is extremely complicated. And it's never black or white. Did you notice how the conclusion here, it's not like, did it cure COVID or did it not cure COVID? Well, the answer is that some molecules showed some pretty good indications that we can then in the future work with and build upon to get somewhere better and to develop something even more interesting, right? So. Nuance, that's the key. We're talking about science. Nuance, it's all about nuance. No no black and white stuff. Get that black, the only thing that's I like black and white is my tea. I like black tea and I like white tea and that's about it. So, um, hold on a second. Why the heck is my phone going off? So that's it, you know, that's it. Keep an open mind. When you're thinking about COVID and tea, think about it like that or something. You know, what the hell do I know? <laughs> All right, that's it. Thank you for watching. If you liked the video, like it, subscribe, share it, drink some tea and give me a pat on the back or something. Uh, I'll see you in the next video. Stay healthy, stay positive, and keep sipping tea.